Great. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm Jenny, this is Tony. Um, we'll introduce ourselves in a second, but we're going to be talking about setting up and running an interdisciplinary makerspace. So we're kind of diving straight into the advanced makerspace <laughs> arena. I'm aware this is a, a general talk or evening about makerspaces per se. Um, so we'll try and explain as we go through a little bit about the differences between what we are doing and a normal makerspace. Um, there are a few, but also a lot of similarities. Um, and so first of all, we'll explain who we are and why we're here. Um, so yeah, I'm Jenny. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Biomakespace. I'm a Shuttleworth Foundation Research Fellow in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at the University of Cambridge. I'm sure you're probably familiar with Mark Shuttleworth, founded Canonical and the Ubuntu operating system, and also funds a whole series of fellows who are interested in open source. So my research basically focuses on the role of open source in biotechnology and the bioeconomy, and how we can use some of the principles um, that you have used so, so um, effectively in software to try and um, speed up the development of technology in the bio space. Um, and I'll hand over to Tony. Hi, Hi. Um, my background is in software and electronics development. I've done lots of InfoSec stuff. I run an InfoSec, well, DEFCON London meet up once a month in London in a pub with uh, security talks and including a couple of the speakers that are listed for your uh, next crypto cryptography oriented uh, meeting. Uh, I'm also active in the open rights group on internet privacy and internet rights stuff. Um, Perfect. Okay, so we're going to be um, tag teaming a little bit throughout the talk. So there'll be slight pauses as we pass the microphone between each other, but hopefully it won't disrupt the flow too much. Um, so what is BioMakespace? Um, so it really is a makerspace and biology lab integrated into one. Um, and so we're really interested in building a multidisciplinary, which I think is reflective of most makerspaces, volunteer driven community for collaborative experimentation at the interface of biology and engineering. It was really important to us to have facilities for both the engineering side and the biology side because we think that they have a lot to offer each other um, and certainly we found that engineers are extremely interested in biological systems and biologists are extremely needing <laughs> of engineering skills um, to make their experiments uh, go better, have the tools to do what they need to do. Um, and so we aim to provide an environment where people can come from both sides of that divide, um, meet in the middle work on some interesting projects and hopefully learn something. Um, and so we have um, several primary activities. Um, we want to build a community of motivated and passionate members who engage in a whole bunch of different activities, including skill sharing and training courses. So today I've been doing some synthetic biology with the U3A in Cambridge, who are a group of retired people who have, run, who have already undertaken a theoretical course in um, DNA and cell biology. And so the last four weeks they've been in the lab um, they've been analysing their own DNA, to, and Tony will tell you about a workshop that we run um, on that. And they've also been, um, we were looking at how to build an AND gate using DNA, which I'm not going to describe during the talk, but if you want to ask at the end, I'd be delighted to tell you. Um, so, so we want to kind of offer up this biotechnology arena to people who would not typically have access to it. Um, and that includes um, people who want to kind of do research projects in interdisciplinary teams or who are interested to do biological stuff but um, have for whatever reason um, no access to the facilities. Um, we also are interested in facilitating proof of concept for entrepreneurs so we currently have um, five corporate members who are companies that need to do those sort of initial experiments to get off the ground um, and they use our space uh, to an extremely reasonable rate um, during the day and then our volunteer members come in in the evening um, to do their projects and we're really interested in increasing access to technologies and as we'll explain later we're engaging globally with a whole network of these similar spaces in, in much the same way that your your normal maker spaces that don't have the bio component are part of a much broader network um, so we thought we'd say a little bit about, I mean, I think my, my interest in this is probably self-evident. So I am a molecular biologist by background. I'm very interested in access to technologies. And I was keen to experiment with this sort of model of, of providing the access. But um, Tony will explain a little bit about his interest in getting involved because that's... Maybe. Uh, so one of the other activities that I didn't mention in my bio... Uh, that I've been volunteering with is with the British Science Association. 
uh, doing uh, public engagement in science in, in the Cambridge area, particularly during the science festival. Um, so I've taken that interest into the biomech space. So we've done activities, well, we've done activities for three years each March in Cambridge, uh, outreach to uh, the public and other science uh, scientists and health professionals and whatever. It, um, so the uh, reason I stumbled over the three years is because I hadn't mentioned that we've been operating for 18 months. And part of the reason we've been operating for 18 months is because of the bureaucracy of getting through the lease paperwork for um, X lab space in, in the, a university building. Um, so I'll, Jenny might um, return to that shortly, but it's it just it's a huge, difficult journey going through the bureaucracy. But we've been blessed with some other luck in Cambridge with a big community, both at the university, uh, the make space, uh, lots of people interested in the activities we're doing. Um, so going back to the outreach, this uh, training course on genetics that uh, Jenny was teaching today. So University of the Third Age is our, our first cohort where we want to develop uh, a number of courses that we can give to the public and charge for. And this is a sort of practice run through this course. We want to develop some more courses, uh, introducing people to lab work. Uh, one, one of the activities we did at the uh, Science Festival this last March was a bitterness tasting workshop uh, where people tested a, tasted a piece of paper with PTC and the so-called super tasters can taste that as being very bitter. And then there's a workshop uh, on the saliva trying to extract the DNA markers for whether you are a super taster. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it introduces people who don't have necessarily a biology background or who uh, have let it rust a bit uh, to current practices. And this kind of technique is also used in uh, medical diagnostics. Um, Great. And so our community is, is kind of, I'd say, 50-50 biologists and engineers, and the engineers split into various software engineers, mechanical, hardware, um, and some people who are more from the art side, surprisingly very interested in, very, many artists are interested in science and biology as a medium. So there's actually, I'm, I'm uh, uh, giving some advice at the moment to the person setting up um, Central St. Martin's new bio lab, um, which is just focused on art. And the RCA also runs um, a, sci a bio design course as well. So there's, we do have people from outside, but I would say typically our members have um, a STEM background of some description. And so this maybe will foreshadow some of the things that perhaps Laura and Adrian are going to talk about, maybe in terms of the types of communities that you see at these spaces. But certainly we don't, we try, although we do a lot, Pub, uh, we do targeted public engagement. We don't advertise Biomake Space as a place where anybody with any background can come and learn because for us, that's not realistic at the minute. We don't have the time to give, to build up the skills to the point where anyone can come in and do some biology, but we're working towards it. Um, but there is this kind of aspiration that this global network eventually could be a means for people to come from any background and to, to move into this space. But as they typically our members have are either students or have a degree in a STEM area. Um, so, um, yeah, so this is the idea that people come in um, who may be a programmer, maybe some students, maybe a science teacher, and we kind of, they just get involved in a whole bunch of different stuff. And so this is just kind of one track through where you might go. Um, so, you know, take our Molecular Biology 101 course that we're developing. Um, this is a, we have had a team project to build um, biosensors in the lab run by the students um, and then you know we might have people who volunteer to teach some of these skills and suddenly find that actually those skills all come together in a great project that we can work on um, and that might spin off into maybe ideas for startups or social enterprises um, maybe some educational activities and so this is kind of milieu of stuff that we want to see and I think we're still getting there at the moment and so the next section of our talk we'll just talk a little bit about um, setting up bio make space um, and which is one of the topics we were asked to touch on. Um, so I'll hand back to Tony, he'll tell you a little bit about the lab. Um. Well, I'll try. You're, you're the expert on, on, on quite a bit of it. Um, so
when they did an upgrade. Uh, so it's, um, it's interesting if you're not familiar with the technology and it illuminates a layer in the sample with a laser and then you can take photos and build up a 3D image and you can use different colors of laser um, but biology generally uses a nice green one that stimulates the chlorophyll. Yeah, um, flow hood. So there's a suppose there's an airflow through it, so it, it circulates out of the chimney and any um, chemicals or stuff that you, not a fume cup. You can't put a strong acid. samples and reagents. Uh, the room to the far left is our workshop or dry lab. Um, so we've got 3D printing, we've got electrophysics, we've got a uh, that's kind of stuff we're looking to get a, a laser cutter and we haven't quite got there yet. Needs need a little bit more budget. We've got we, 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 we've been donated at one of these Chinese ones that haven't got IEC safety labels and things on, which isn't ideal for a lab. So, you, so we even need to make that safe or, or swap it out for something a little bit more um, suitable for a shared space. Great. So in terms of practicalities, um, as Tony has previously alluded to, this is a university space, but we are an independent company. We're a not-for-profit, limited by guarantee, and we're a tenant of the university. So we pay, um, fortunately, not rent. So they are um, subsidizing us, basically, to be in the space. We pay a service charge and electricity and stuff. Um, but effectively, we were, we were very lucky to find these rooms. And in that sense, had a similar journey to the Cambridge Make Space, who also were fortunate enough to find a space um, that the university owned that was available. Um, um, and so we moved in, uh, and as Tony said, we we had a, a somewhat of a saga with just you know just setting everything up. Um, but the main thing to say is that it was entirely set up by as a volunteer effort. So evenings and weekends, getting down the space and bringing everything in. So I'm going to show you some photos of the space, including what it looked used to look like. Um, but basically, everything that you see, if it wasn't donated, um, and we're fortunate enough being in Cambridge that a lot of companies are biotech companies, so they frequently have equipment that comes available. Um, there are many university departments that might upgrade, like the microscope, for example. Tomorrow, I am scheduled to go skip diving because I spotted something in a skip. Emailed the person in the department, they were like, yeah, have it. So Roger and me are gonna go pick up a frame for one of our, we want a bench that we can move around. So, so it's basically been kind of cobbled together. I've got very good at buying stuff cheap on eBay. So we've got a lot of secondhand equipment in there um, and also stuff that we've just kind of, we've just bought um, because we needed it. Um, and so, so we're the entire lab set up cost us um, around £30,000 for everything that you're going to see. Um, the actually most expensive part of equipping this was our um, workshop slash maker lab because no one's throwing out 3D printers right now. <laughs> so we did buy one. Although having said that, we have been offered we have been offered a 3D printer recently, but it's actually, it's more difficult to get hold of good electronics equipment and that kind of thing in Cambridge than it is to get hold of some <laughs> biological equipment, which I think is a Cambridge thing. I don't think that is true necessarily everywhere else. So what do you need in a bio lab? You need some equipment, you need some uh, reagents, which is what biologists use to refer to anything we stick in tubes. So chemicals, biological things, you want some knowledge and some data. And then, you know, there's kind of, there's inputs and outputs from the lab in all of these forms. And so when we're setting it up, we had to deal with managing stuff coming in and also managing stuff going out. So um, because so this is a major difference between us and a makerspace, um, we have to deal with a lot more chemicals. Um, so our kind of health and safety has to be a little bit more complex than in a normal makerspace. And we're also dealing with biological organisms. So same deal, really. Um, so this is where we're based. This is the old um, MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology which has since moved to a fancy new building where we're the yeah the bit on the left this is another building we're in the basement here um, and so when we inherited the rooms they looked a bit like this so this is an old fermentation suite um, as you see that is a concrete flood barrier because there used to be large tanks where they would um, basically uh, grow lots of bacteria um, and this is a 250 kilogram continuous centrifuge which 
will spin down the bacteria so that you can collect them, which is bolted into the floor. And someone clearly had a go at getting out and just gave up. <laughs> so, so this is this is what we we started with. Um, and then over several months, um, we managed to turn it into this lovely maker lab here. That's our two interns from last summer. So we basically got rid of all of the, I have some lovely before and after photos as well, but just to show you with the equipment in. So we got rid of all of that. We painted the walls. You can see all the piping is gone and we put in benches. We've got our 3D printing center over here. And at the back, you can see the Faraday cage, which is where the electrophysiology experiments happen. Um, we That's 3D printing. Uh, one of the DNA polymerases that my intern was working on. Um, and so this is the main lab, which was basically completely empty. We, we managed to get some other, some stuff from another lab in the building that was about to be ripped out. So this is the team that did the original fit out. And as you can see, by this point, we've put a load of shelves up on the wall. Everything's been kind of arranged and we're unpacking another lot of donations that we got. And this is pretty much what the lab looks like now. So it looks pretty much a standard lab um, from an empty room we've gone to having everything in place a whole bunch of equipment um, and so for example you can do amplify lots of bits of DNA so we've got a couple of PCR machines here which you might have heard of the, that technique before um, this one has a big head on it to look at um, how much DNA you're producing over time so there's some fancy optics and sensors in there and as as um, Tony mentioned I mean most of the other stuff heats it up spins it round those kinds of things um, yeah, exactly. Biology likes to be either warm or cold, depending, <laughs> depending on what. And then we've run a whole bunch of workshops. So this is us doing some PCR. I think we, this was our plant PCR workshop. Um, so uh, Juan is a, a data scientist. Um, and then we've got Anna, who is a biomedical scientist, Pavan, who is a software engineer um, and slash data scientist, bioinformatics person, um, and Carl, who um, was working in a lab before but now does more kind of regulatory office work so it's a, a kind of nice collection of people um and here we are again um emray at the back there um worked at arm uh, scott is a software engineer so it's quite it's quite a broad community we do tend to get more engineers to the biology events as you might imagine because that's the bit that they want to learn about so um so we're part of a global community there are many more of these spaces um and that is under the banner of uh, DIY biology. And so all over the world, um, people have set up these labs and the idea is that they are open and there's a kind of open um, culture that runs through them, both in terms of being open to people to come in. As I mentioned, I think, you know, it's not a, absolutely anyone can come here and get something out of it. There's still a, a quite a barrier to entry, um, but the the spirit is there. And certainly there's a lot of interest in, in performing um, scientific experiments that are published openly that are you know you're building tools that you share um, these are the locations of a lot of diy bio projects or spaces you can see that they're largely clustered in the us and europe which i think would match pretty well with the maker space map as well um, but there are a few smattered around um, latin america particularly i think since this map was done there are many more spaces in latin america and, and a few in africa um, we'll come back to that later um but yes yeah, so they're all over the place um and some examples uh bio curious is is one of the older um bio makers that's in san francisco as you might as you might imagine. they they've got this down they also have the joy of a lot of biotech companies in the area so they've been equipped very well they're much bigger than us as you can see here i'm sorry it's such a grainy photo it didn't look like that on the screen um, and they're doing some cool projects including looking at um, some uh, dna and rna sequencing in cuttlefish they grow some cuttlefish in the lab and are experimenting uh, with them um, there's also a gen space in new york which is another kind of older lab they do a lot of uh, work with designers and artists and workshops um, so this is Genspace, as you can see, they're kind of and um, have a, a strong educational focus. They have school groups that come in as well. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to go and run a workshop at Genspace and I'm currently working with them and some other labs on an open, open access um, bio safety handbook, which as you can imagine is a thrilling <laughs> writing project, but it's really important. So it, the idea is that we can kind of share some of the knowledge that we 
and obviously it's being kind of edited and overseen by people with really strong biosafety background to just make sure that people can do this and do it safely with a low budget and in a low resource context. Um, and so I imagine that will be out towards the end of the year. My last set of chapters were personal protective equipment and waste management. It's been a fun two month ride. <laughs> and so just to say this is this also, kind of, uh, you know, there is, there is a and um, academia. So we're obviously kind of in a university building supported by the university. A lot of spaces, if not in a university building, um, universities and academics have academics as members. Um, this, at least in this kind of biological engineering space, every year called iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which brings in three, over 300 graduate teams from around the world. Um, and this has been a massive source of people who've kind of got, they basically have a very similar spirit to what I've just described. Um, they share their parts openly, they, does, they document everything on a wiki. Um, and so people who emerge from this competition, quite a few of them get involved in these spaces. So there are kind of, I guess, pathways um, to get people into the community. And iGEM is a really good one. So on Monday, we have two BioMakeSpace interns starting for the summer, and one of them um, was a, was previously an iGEM team member, and that was what really got her into it. And this has been running since 2000. And there's a really big community of passed through the competition. Um, so I've, we've described a little bit about some of the practicalities. I mean, there are other practicalities. One, we're a company, so there's all of the company FAF, bank accounts, that sort of thing. Um, health and safety wise, we have a safety committee. Tony is our fire safety officer. I'm the biological safety officer. Roger is our, sa our general safety officer. Um, and so we have to risk assess all of our projects that are coming through, which again is kind of unlike most makerspaces. If you're taught to use a 3D printer, as long as it's not printing something illegal, I saw there's a BBC article about guns again recently, so that is rearing its head again. Um, but as long as you're not printing anything like that, uh, you can pretty much go ahead and print what you want. Unfortunately, not true in our context. We need to know what biology things you're using and what chemicals you're using. So we try and make it as lightweight as possible, but there is um, a, a bureaucratic overhead that we just can't get around because um, the work that we do is overseen by the health and safety executive. And um, if we do it wrong, then we have, I believe, unlimited fines. I say we, me <laughs> and the three other directors. Um, so, so we're very keen to get it right. Um, because we do genetic modification in the space, we also, um, in, in the UK, it's not quite a license to do genetic modification. So we do really low risk stuff. And if you're just doing really low risk stuff, you're not working with disease causing organisms. You basically, what's called notify HSE. So to them and say we're going to do this you send them a risk assessment you fill in a form you pay 500 pounds and then they have the right to come in and inspect all of your paperwork but it's somewhat onerous i mean you, you have to keep all the risk assessments for at least 10 years that there are there are things that you need to do so if you you know i in terms of setting up something like this it's it can't be undertaken lightly but it's not um you know there are there are harder things to do in the world <laughs> than set up something like the biomix space Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I've mentioned the global community, but of course, there are places closer to home. So um, recently moved from Hackney to Wembley, the London Fire Hack space predated us. So we can't claim to be the first in the UK. Um, they, I think, were set up four years before, something around that, five years before. Um, and so they have a very similar program of activities. I say they've just moved with the London Hack space. Um, and I, I was just going to comment. They demonstrated that. Uh, DIY bio place in the UK can get the GM license because they applied before us and so we knew it was possible and we could go to them for advice on how to get that done. Yeah, yeah absolutely and, and most people who set up these spaces are very happy to help other people do the same. Um, so um, I'm just going to introduce briefly two spaces in Africa which I'm involved in setting up at the moment. Um, so these are again uh, spaces that combine, they're, they're both spaces that combine biology and hardware. Um, so the first one is, um, oh, actually, so I was going to say, yeah, the, the Maker Fair Africa did have a synthetic biology kind of track the last time that it ran. And so there is there is interest in this type of work, um, but it depends where you are in Africa, but some of, even at a university level, some of the techniques that we would use kind of for a training course in the biomake space are difficult to do, um, largely because of supply chain, to be honest. That's just, it's just difficult to get hold of the stuff. Uh, so a lot of my re research is trying to address some of that. Um, and we're, we're currently working with 
setting up labs outside of universities that can kind of be a little bit more agile in giving opportunities to try out these practical techniques and to learn some of the engineering approaches. And they're both paired with um, maker spaces or fab labs. So whenever we're setting up a, a biology lab, it also has access to things like 3D printing, laser cutting, electronics, um, and they found that extremely useful. So uh, the first lab is um, in Cameroon, the lab, um, and they are um, associated with Goya Fab Lab. Um, and so they have been working on setting up at the moment just, just the actual lab. So these are the lab benches which have gone in recently. Um, my postdoc is heading out on Thursday <laughs> with a whole bunch of equipment. So soon it will start looking more and more like a lab. Um, and this is Lenshina and Stefan, who are two biologists um, who are working on the project. Um, and their most recent project has been uh, developing an open source beta for cells. So they need to keep their bacteria at 37 degrees. Um, there are, it's quite difficult to get hold of like standard lab equipment. Um, been working with um, basically a picnic kind of thermo um, hamper uh, and uh, a heat source, which in this case is a light bulb and some uh, Arduino based control over that temperature. Uh, and so this is an extremely cheap way for them to get effectively what they need, which is a 37 degrees box. Um, and to be honest, even you know in the UK, I've recommended to people before just to use something like an electric blanket, which is actually at 37 because that's body temperature, to just keep some plates warm. And you can, you know, that's all you need. You don't need anything fancy for this particular use case. Um, Kumasi Hive is based in Ghana. Um, and this is, again, at the same stage. We've got the benches in. We've got to get the equipment in. And Kumasi Hive has an, in, this is the innovation center near Kumasi, which um, teaches a lot of courses on IoT, machine learning, um, kind of graphic design, web design uh, for Ghanaian grad, uh, students and recent graduates. And they have a, their own makerspace. So um, quite a lot of the things were made in the space. Um, we've also uh, got a hood, which Tony mentioned before. This isn't an airflow hood, but it's basically just a, a kind of clean box that you can sterilize with UV light. Um, and this was made entirely in the hive, actually using a design from um, Stick Lab in Tanzania which is another makerspace. So they shared the design with the Hive. The Hive have built it. Next, it's going to mobile so they can make their own. And each along the way, they're kind of improving it and hopefully documenting it <laughs> because that's the next stage. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the Hive Biolab is also running Biomaker Challenge, which is teaching um, biology students how to use basic electronics to control their experiments. And um, we're very keen to see more of that happening. Um, and Latin America are really active as well. So there's a big Syntech bio community in Latin America. TechnoX is a, um, a competition. Which um, and so that's another kind of global engagement. And I work quite closely with one of the organizers of TechnoX. Um, so we will very rapidly just whiz through the hardware section, I think. You're okay with that? Great. Um, so why are we interested in hardware when we're doing a biomaker lab? Well, uh, we need loads of tools. As I mentioned, some of them are easy. Some of them just heat sort of stuff up. Some of them around. Some of them move liquid from one place to another. But typically, scientific is expensive. Um, and I'm talking like... If you want a piece of plastic with some little comb bits on it for your gel electrophoresis, which is basically, it's just a comb, um, it's a mold where you can make a little, a well we call it, in a jelly so that you can put your DNA in, 20 quid for a little bit of plastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes but it's 20 pounds time. So even tiny little things like that, if you, if you say that they're for a lab, then the cost increases quite a lot. Microscopes, very expensive. Um, you know, pretty much any piece of lab equipment is on the order of, a hundred, of hundreds of pounds. Sometimes for good reason, don't get me wrong, but sometimes not so much. Um, so, <laughs> so it's also proprietary often. It can be difficult to source, particularly for our colleagues um, in Africa, Latin America, difficult to customize. And this is key really. I'm not just about saving money, but it's about being able to customize the hardware to do the best experiment. Um, as biologists, uh, we're often trained to just get something off the shelf and try and adapt our experiment to fit the hardware. And really, we should be adapting the hardware to fit the experiment. And I think that's the kind of freedom that this use of um, sharing designs for hardware and also using digital fabrication and customization can improve the science if done correctly. 
Um, and yeah, it's hard to maintain. So one of the other benefits of sending out, um, if not sending out like donated hardware to Ghana, but instead them building it there in the Maker Lab is that they can fix it because they know how it works um, and they don't have to call out engineers from other places. Um, so yeah, so makers and people in maker spaces open source, people can manufactured hyper locally that's hopefully openly documented and well documented or that is a <laughs> common cause of problems <laughs> when it comes to building stuff for science because you really need it if you want to it has to be really well documented i mean there's general frustrations with how poorly documented open hardware is generally but if you start moving into a scientific domain those kind of problems and headaches just to kind of compound um, and we want it to be easier to customize um, so ideally at least explaining the function as well as the particular design so there are a lot out there here are some examples um, this is a tank that allows you to operate these are the things that would normally cost 20 pounds um, we've 3d printed them there but they could also be laser cut this entire tank would generally cost you anywhere between 300 and 700 pounds from a scientific supplier but it's around about well it depends the actually most expensive component of this is the platinum wire which goes to form the electrodes at either side so if you do it a laser cutter um and unplug probably around um 100 to 150 with the power pack and that depends so we're testing out some lower cost wires as well which might bring the cost down even further this is a very nifty open source 3d printed microscope here which gives you a wonderful um using the flex of the plastic to move the stage gives you sub micron precision in your xy translation brilliant design they're also building other bits of kit that use essentially the same mechanism um, and i won't go into the other microscopes there's a lot of microscopes Biologists are building loads of that. Oh, here's another. So this is the micro manipulator, which will align. It's actually for aligning optical fibers, but you can also use it to align tiny little needles. I used to have to inject mosquito eggs as a PhD student, and we had to use something similar to this to line up the tiny needle to inject the mosquito egg. Um, digital microfluidics, also getting quite popular in the open science hardware community. So this is OpenDrop, which is a little platform where you can around um, using an electrical platform um, and that allows you to mix different chemicals break them apart do different reactions um, and that's a, an electrophysiology kit for um, education in the corner there so um, we talked about the hardware but there's also biological stuff and so I'll just spend two minutes before we kind of wrap up and move to questions talking about um, biology and how open source fits into that so typically it's actually surprisingly difficult to get hold of biology things that are truly open and the reason is sometimes patents so obviously people patent um, all sorts of biological things it, it's getting less easy to patent um, DNA that just comes directly from nature you may have fo followed a court case with um, the BRCA gene which is a very um, a very uh, kind of highly correlated indicator of risk of breast cancer and so a company had the patent on the BRCA gene which meant that pretty much only that company could provide diagnostic testing um, and so this was um, as you might imagine heavily disputed because all they'd done is isolate the gene <laughs> and they would patented that particular bit of DNA and so now it's less common to be able to do that but there are many other things that you can patent and, and if you change the DNA or modify it in some way you're still able to patent that so they only stopped you patenting DNA as, as directly from nature um, and most people who are engineering with DNA have changed it in some in some manner or another um, so so we're interested in all of these things chemicals um, biology stuff as you can see this is nine percent of using pipettes to move bits of liquid around we're slowly getting towards automating that and there are now open source robots for doing it which are bringing down the cost greatly but we want to share dna we want to share and plant materials and all sorts of other biological stuff um, and so typically what happens is even if there's not a patent on that particular biological thing it's a physical thing and so the, there is a, an ownership of that thing right so i'm the university of cambridge i have a bit of dna and someone else wants to use it um, let's say university of edinburgh so in order for me to send my bit of dna to the university of edinburgh the universities will for, will sign a contract called a material transfer agreement um, and that agreement by default as the kind of standardized 
UBMTA, the Uniform Biological Material Transfer Agreement, does not allow redistribution, it does not allow commercial use, and it has none of the freedoms <laughs> that you would want to see, for example, in the you know, free software or open hardware world. Um, so I've been working with a lawyer, uh, Linda Kale in the US, um, and Linda has drawn up um, an open material transfer agreement, which is a just standard that enables individuals and organizations to share those materials on an open basis. So we're trying to kind of shift um, at least, you know, the default at the moment is closed. So at least if we can offer an alternative, there can be a decision-making point. At the minute, there is no decision-making point. It's just you want material, have it under a UBMTA. And so at least now this is there, and we're trying to get more and more universities to accept it as a, as a valid document <laughs> that they may want to sign up to at some point and transfer some materials under. And so um, the goals of the Open MTA will be very familiar to you as open source specialists, um, but we wanted to encourage access, attribution, reuse, redistribution, and non-discrimination. So you can use it for commercial use. Um, and so this is uh, was addressing a paradox where a project was producing DNA that was deliberately off patent. They wanted it to be as open as possible. And they couldn't, they found they just couldn't distribute it because all of the universities would only accept a, a material transfer agreement that restricted your use. So you know, most you can ignore it, that is true, but it's better if it's clear and there's a legal trail to say you can do this with it. Um, so that's that's uh, kind of biology. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about some of the ins and outs of open source in biology, but um, we also wanted time for questions. So we've kind of wrapped up that last section. So we, we're, we've got 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, the final thing is to say that there is a lot of activity here. So I've introduced a few of, of the things. Um, Biomake space is one space. We're based in Cambridge. Um, not everybody is. So, so we're, quite, we're quite a local thing. And that's kind of the point of these physical spaces is that they're local hubs for activity, but they're virtually connected to a whole bunch of other places. So if you're in London and this is an interest, of course, is the London Biohackers. There are also um, bigger communities. Like I mentioned, the DIY community has a mailing list where people share different ideas. Um, if you're interested in open hardware for science, um, there's the Global Open Science Hardware Community, or GOSH, who run the gathering for open science hardware. And we have a forum um, at forum.openhardware.science um, and a website where you can find out information. And we've, we've ran, run now three international meetings, one at CERN, which is home of the CERN Open Hardware License, um, one in uh, Chile in Santiago and one in Shenzhen. Um, and we haven't got the next one organized yet, but there will be one probably in 2020. Um, and so that's just, um, it was formed because we felt like many of the open hardware groups were not addressing um, to the same extent as we felt was necessary some of these issues around reproducibility, calibration, standardization, because for a lot of open hardware applications, it's not as critical as it might be in a, in a scientific context. And the, the nature of scientific instrumentation, um, there are particular kind of things that we're going to use again and again and again, which wouldn't necessarily be used outside of that context. So we felt the scope for a, a global community. And we've been um, funded very graciously by the Alfred Sloan Foundation for a lot of that work. Um, but it's now kind of ongoing. So there's resident open hardware residencies for science happening in Latin America in four different countries. Um, there is a Great Lakes meeting that is happening in about two weeks, which is um, kind of the North American community getting together. And we're slowly growing out. Um, and then in terms of open biology, there are various networks that are trying to draw people together, including the Global Community Bio Summit based out of the MIT Media Lab, who meet once a year in October and also have a network of international fellows, which two of our, so um, Thomas Mboa, who runs Mboa Lab that I showed you earlier and is a member of my team, and Harry Aklago, who's our researcher in Ghana um, and is setting up the Hive Bio Lab. They're both fellows in that program. Um, and so there are efforts to kind of bring the activities around. Um, and I think, have you got anything to add? Um, well, I was just going to say, part of, a lot of this open ha hardware, open science hardware stuff has got uh, Arduinos for doing sequencing, or maybe a Raspberry Pi or a Beagle board that can do a uh, higher level of processing. And it kind of feels to me quite like in the late 80s, early 90s, where people had BBC micros in the university and it got moved into the lab and started automating. Uh, lab equipment and that kind of thing. So it, 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 there's huge opportunities because of the low cost of a hard now and ability to um, self-instruction material on the internet. Uh, 
questions? Hi there. That was that was really interesting. I don't know much about biology. And I don't know much about makerspaces either. So that sounds really valuable. Um, I have I have a couple of questions. One is, you mentioned the um, the paperwork. Do you have to do anything around ethics? And the second question is, um, when you're sending all this stuff to Africa, do you have to do anything with um, trade exports? Um, so on the ethics front, um, yes, we do think about that. So one of the reasons for having projects be proposed in the space is that it gives us a chance to look at if there are any ethical considerations. Um, we don't do anything that involves um, Part, so the PTC gene is a very carefully selected workshop because there is no known correlation between your ability as a super taster with any health condition. So what we don't allow in Biomake Space is self-testing of any health conditions and we don't run workshops which enable people to do that because of the ethical concerns around finding something that you would really want to be in a position where you have genetic counselling and people around who can give you advice on that. Um, so I, I'd also add to that is the reliability. We've got no the equipment might not be calibrated, we don't have positive controls, we don't have any laboratory staff that are, are, are certified for, for doing diagnostic tests and that kind of stuff. Yep, so in terms of medical ethics, we basically avoid the problem by not having any of those experiments done. Um, at the moment, there's so that there are part of the risk assessment for the genetic modification is looking at risks to health and the environment. So it's not ethics per se, but certainly kind of potential um, for any harm. And everything that we do in the biomake space is low to no risk. It has to be in that classification, otherwise it would be a higher level of lab that would be required. Um, to be honest, the most dangerous thing in the lab is probably the chemicals <laughs> than the, compared to the biology stuff. Um, but yeah, the other ethical point that might come in is if we started, for example, using animals. Um, so the only animals that we will be using in the space are Drosophila, fruit flies, which are very common lab creatures. And as invertebrates, not classed um, within any of the kind of legal regulations and then it's kind of a personal ethics view whether you think that um, flies should be used in experiments or not um, but yeah we don't we so we, most of what we're doing doesn't fit into um, kind of formal ethical frameworks but we obviously keep a very close eye on it and yes when we're moving any materials around um, you have to take into account kind of import export regulations what's allowed in the country authorizations all that sort of thing so it's I mean so the biomex space itself doesn't tend to ship stuff around those two examples I collaborate with mine at the university, which is much better set up for doing that sort of thing than we are as a kind of small group of volunteers who don't really have time to fill in all the paperwork ourselves. <laughs> Just before I hand it over, the, um, to anyone who's listening remotely, the chat mechanism isn't working. Um, if you'd like to tweet on BCS OSSG, I will pick up the questions and pass them on. In terms of using um, secondhand equipment or open hardware, how much is that restricting what you're actually able to achieve compared with uh, the, the tens of thousands of pounds of, of new equipment? To be honest, not too much. Um, I mean, most of the experiments that people want to do in the lab um, are not requiring tens of thousands of pounds of equipment. Um, if they do, then um, we can always talk to people at the university about maybe getting access. Um, we can think about ways that we can get the same data without that equipment. So, so far it hasn't been a major issue for us. There are some, I mean, as Tony mentioned, we're a very small space. So there are some things which are not tens of thousands of pounds, we just don't have physical space to put them. Um, so there are certainly projects which, you know, can't go ahead because of our lack of facilities, but try to cater for the majority of what our members want to do um, and and so I think I think I wouldn't say it, it is limiting us too much um, at the moment uh, but you know again we're in a very fortunate geographical location where, <laughs> whereby we have these options um, and so and it's just it, it's a case of kind of so although I said you know you want to adapt the hardware to the experiment I say firstly a lot of the current stuff that we have is probably is sometimes overpowered for what is actually required for a particular thing so you can do a lot with a kind of 
cheaper bit of kit or kind of something or some creative thinking around your experimental design um, and so you know the, when you're doing science in a low resource context there is a lot of creativity out there about how you do it well but how you do it cheaply and actually that that's something that we can learn from our African colleagues and people who are trying to do this who've had to uh, work around a lot of problems and get creative about how to do it um, and certainly sort of I've been learning molecular biology techniques from colleagues in Ghana who've essentially got around very expensive commercial kits by coming up with their own solutions to the problem and then validated it and the thing with science is you have to just go back and validate it so it's not so much did my equipment cost a hundred pounds or ten thousand pounds it's what are your calibration standards and protocols what are the quality assurance measures that you've got in place to demonstrate that it's working and so there are concerns with people using open hardware particularly although I guess you know lower cost hardware and kind of second-hand hardware is, is true as well um, that's Although in, in theory, it's good because different people can produce the same instrument, so you should have greater reproducibility. There's always going to be differences when you're just when you're manufacturing in different places. And so one of the kind of key things that we try to emphasize in the global open science hardware community is really thinking through that. What are your inbuilt calibration um, design features of that piece of hardware or do you have to supply other things with the hardware to enable you to calibrate it um, and so that's I, I think it's a major challenge and not one that's been solved but it is at least getting people thinking about how do we have this all um, written down so that people can check that it's working and that one would hope would satisfy a peer reviewer or someone who's looking at the quality of the work to say well yes yeah, so we didn't use the 10,000 pound instrument but here are our series of standardized checks that show that you know it's got really good um, you've done your you've done your pre-work and so you can show that it's got really good correlation with the dilute the standard dilution curve and all the rest of it and so I think it's just it's just doing good science and kind of trying to to balance that experimental design with um, the facilities that you've got available. I was just going to um, mention that we do have some equipment that does need to be tested and serviced, such as the autoclave, yeah. which is a which is a pressure vessel for sterilising lab equipment. So that needs an annual service, and we have to uh, spend money on that. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure whether to ask about insurance or supervision, but it strikes me that if you compare this to, let's say, a, a wood workshop or uh, a standard kind of electronics make space, there's quite a high, to me, quite a high duty on whoever is kind of responsible for the good running of a lab like this. And how, yeah, you must be putting a lot of time into that. documentation that we've got um, but yes I mean basically yeah there is it's a lot of time we do have a team we would love to grow that team a little bit more than we currently have um, but it's again so at the moment we work on a case-by-case -case basis so we do have of course general insurance for the lab you know public liability contents we work with a specialist biotechnology insurance broker so we kind of make sure that it's all um, fitted to what we need um, and and as people come in everyone gets a safety induction um, which is true of make spaces as well generally we try and keep that general because actually some of our members they just want to come to the training sessions and they just want to use the lab and so sitting through three or four hours of bio and chemical safety for those people is not very relevant so we have a safety induction which just basically allows you to access the maker lab and turn up to meetings and and everything um, but uh, if you want to do a project then you submit a project proposal and in that project proposal you'll you'll do a risk assessment or rather you'll work with a safety team I and mean, we recognize most people have not had experience of doing this sort of stuff necessarily before so we work with them to 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 help and also review the the assessments but in that form it says what is your previous experience and so if as many of our members have they've got 10 years of experience of molecular biology they still need to go through we still have to do the training so that they know what they're doing but we can be we can be confident that the level of supervision required would be reasonably minimal once they've had that initial induction um, whereas of course some people will be coming in wanting to do something that have very limited experience and so that the kind of joy of the community is that we try and then pair them with a mentor or someone who will kind of work on the project and we encourage team projects so um, typically we would not be expecting 
um, somebody to come who has no experience of biology and just dive into the lab and start on a project. And we would expect them to join an existing project, get their hands dirty a little bit, well, hopefully not, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then slowly kind of onboard them into gaining a little bit of independence. And so it is time consuming and it is case by case. I think we have a lot less space and we have a lot fewer members than, mo than many make spaces. So we're currently at 50 members, um, but are, of course active fewer than that compared to Cambridge Make Space, which is more like 350 members. And partly it's because, you know, we have not only a physical limitation, but also a time limitation and just how much of that you have to go back and forth. So yeah, I would say it's extremely time consuming. I mean, it's ba it is running another lab. I mean, you know, departments have full-time staff <laughs> to do this type of thing. Um, and we have, to, we have to balance it. So we're probably reaching the point now where we're tailoring, tapering off in terms of um, projects that we can manage. Um, and then we'll have to sort of, you know, consolidate. So I've just been reminded, prompted by uh, Jenny's uh, chat there. Um, we've one of our members is the uh, Cambridge University Synthetic Biology Society. So these are mostly undergrads uh, working on a team project, and the attraction to them of the space is they have access to a lab to work on a project, and it's a project. I mean, if you if you do electronics engineering or computer science, you you go to class, you do the instruction in the class, and then you can go home or whatever. You've got access to that equipment relatively cheaply, and you can carry on doing soldering, circuit design, uh, JavaScript, whatever. Um, it, microbiology undergrad, they do their class. They've got the experiment. They've been told to go and reproduce. The result they've been told to get, and then they don't have a chance to innovate and um, riff with it. Yeah, and so that that student society, um, I was I was down for all of their first few sessions <laughs> to work with them and ensure that everything was set up correctly. And then over time, they graduated to the 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 project leaders are now the supervisors of the of the junior members of the team. Um, and so a good example of how we've kind of slowly onboarded and we, you know, keep in close contact to make sure that they're adhering to the rules and are aware of any updates to the safety and all that. Taken lightly because it does most of my evenings and weekends. <laughs> Jenny and Tony, thank you very much. Um, I hope you'll be around for the rest of the evening so there's an opportunity to ask uh, questions at the end. Um, and. Uh, Thank you again very much.